light of Christ in her state sanctuary. <laughs> Christianity. 
So as you know, it says in the Bible, he says that uh, we're to cast the seed and water. Uh, Paul said, I, I planted the seed, Apollos watered. And that's what we're going to do. We're going we're to cast the seed for those who have not been saved, and we're going to water those who have. And we're going to learn, and we're going to find, we're going to get all the information so that you're comfortable, both with knowing what you believe and what you should believe, as well as being able to share that belief with others. And that's what we're going to work with, and that's going to that's going to meld into our small groups that we're coming that are coming about as well. So I think that all of this is going to come together to make us uh, a, a better church, a more prepared church. And I'm uh, really like everybody to come join us. Come take a look today, see if it's something that you're interested in. We're going to do it in about probably 45 minutes or something like that, because I know everybody wants to get gone for Father's Day lunches and all that kind of stuff. So we won't keep. So, uh, let's see, and, and so super excited about that class, actually. Uh, also, small groups, uh, meeting with a couple of leaders and some folks from some groups this week, so uh, that's a little bit more of a walk than a run than I anticipated, so don't give up on me. I uh, should see something here in the next couple of weeks if you've signed up for that. Uh, quick reminder, church council meeting the 22nd, uh, this Wednesday, 6 p.m., and uh, trustees will meet really quick at the end of worship today in between worship and foundations will be quick because if you want in that foundations class we want to get you there but just real quick update if you're a trustee meet here after church after worship and uh kathy you'll have to be in charge of greeting folks today because i'm gonna have to yep <laughs> so, anyway all right so uh any other announcements all right well the choir is going to lead us into a time of worship and prayer and then we'll spend a little time in prayer expecting to be home if she's not home today uh, she's expecting to be home uh, soon any other updates or testimonies or praises all right let's pray heavenly father we come before you you are an awesome god uh, you are uh, worthy of our praise and our all and our amazement and help us not to forget that today God, that as we come into this place and we come into this place to worship you, we come into this place to meet with you, to meet with the maker and the creator, to meet with our savior and our friend, to meet with our Lord and our God. This is no minor thing that we do today. As we come into your house as we come with the Holy Spirit within us, as we come just to gather together in fellowship, to gather together with our brothers and our sisters in one family under one head, which is you. Heavenly Father, that your spirit would fill this place, that our hearts would be overwhelmed and overflowing with your love, with your peace, with your presence, 
that we would be in awe of our awesome God. Lord, on, on this Father's Day where, where we remember our fathers and where we honor our fathers, God, we thank you for the time that our fathers have put in. We praise you and thank you most of all for our good and holy and perfect Heavenly Father who has been with us all along the way, who has loved us every step. <clears throat> Father, we love you and we praise you. And we ask that you would take over the service. And we ask all these things in your precious name as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will continue to worship God with our tithes and with our offerings. And uh, Sam, if you would like, would you like to sing? Yeah? Right on. I'm going to invite Sam up uh, to sing during our offering. Uh, and uh, you guys are going to be blessed by this. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for the gifts that you have given us and we pray that you would bless those gifts as we, as we give them back to you. We thank you for more than that. We thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit in our lives, and we pray that you would bless those as well as we give those back to you. In your name we pray. Amen.
out of the park. Great job, Sam. Let's stand. <laughs>
bonus and, uh, on top, man. Uh, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your deep, deep love. Thank you for the way that you love us and care for us. And we pray that that would make all the difference in our lives today as we open our eyes and our hearts to the love of a Heavenly Father who has never once given up on us and never once left us alone, but has walked with us in the valleys and on the mountaintops. Let us remember your love today and let us rest and have comfort and peace and assurance and let that create a joy within our hearts as we remember your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, so, uh, so we've been in Acts a little bit. Uh, just a reminder of the book of Acts. Uh, Luke, the, uh, the writer here inspired by the Holy Spirit, Jesus has come and spent time with the disciples. Jesus has gone back up into heaven. The Holy Spirit has come and filled the disciples in that upper room. The disciples have been filled with the Spirit. Uh, they spoke and uh, Peter preached a sermon to the folks around. Uh, multitudes of people believed in Jesus. The church was formed in Acts 2. And uh, what we talked about last week, 242 through 47, God uh, spoke in, Holy Spirit inspired in that passage and said, church, here's how to act. Fellowship together. Worship together. Uh, remember me. Be filled up and go out and reach out. And so what we've got today is Peter and John going out. They're so full of His Spirit that they can't stay there anymore and they got to go out. Have you ever been just kind of bubbling up with some news or bubbling up with something where you just couldn't hold it inside and you had to get it out? Because that's how they felt, right? And it, it reminds me of a story I heard years ago. I heard a pastor tell, and this is probably plagiarism because I can't remember which pastor. Just know it wasn't me. And then it's not plagiarism, okay? But I heard a pastor tell a story years back. And, and this pastor, he was a, a Baptist preacher, and he was at uh, First Baptist Church downtown. It was a, kind of a, a high-profile church. And he would go out of town every now and again. He would preach to some other congregations. He would preach to some other churches. And, uh, and when he got home, he had two young boys and a wife that had been waiting at home. And he loved just to get back home. And his kids would greet him at the door, and they'd have a good time. And so... So he would, he remembers, he said, man, I would come home and my boys loved wrestling. Now there's a difference between wrestling and wrestling, right? Wrestling, that's what you do in high school. It's very official, Olympic-wise. That's, that's, and wrestling is different, right? If you, if you watch wrestling, you know, that's different. Ric Flair, woo, you can beat a man, you got to beat the man. Ric Flair, right? Hulk <laughs> uh, Hogan, Jimmy the Boogie Woogie Man Madden, if you remember those guys, that's different, right? So he said, my kids love wrestling. And when I got home, we would roll on the floor and we would wrestle. He said, and my youngest boy, he liked to be Hulk Hogan, and he would jump off the bottom rope and he'd give a whole, right, if anybody remembers Hulk Hogan. <laughs> so uh, he did one of those, you know, and he said, we'd have a good time. You know, he said, and then at the end of the night, I'd say, all right, boys, go to bed, get on out of here. I'm going to the bedroom, I'm tired, I'm weary. We're going to lock doors that haven't been locked in three days. I'm going to sleep, right? So he would go to bed, right? And he said that first time, he, he started to go up to his bedroom, told his boys to go, went down, got himself water, went up to the bedroom, and there's his two boys in bed with his wife. And he said, no, 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 no. This won't work. <laughs> he said, you boys go to your bedroom. And his boys said, Dad, since you've been gone, we've been taking care of Mom. And we've been staying in her bed to make sure she's safe. So we feel like we ought to keep, keep her safe. And he said, no, I don't think so. I think you better go to your own bed. And his, the mama said, oh, but they're so sweet. Just, just let them stay. Just let them stay. And he said he lost the battle that night, so they stayed. So a couple weeks later, it's time for him to go out of town. So he meets with his sons, big, rest, big wrestling fans, right? And he said, I'll tell you what. I want you to take good care of your mama. But you better sleep in your own bed while I'm gone. He said, in fact, if you both sleep in your own bed while I'm gone, I will bring home a Hulk Hogan wrestling buddy. Now, if you're old enough to remember that, remember that's a stuffy about that big, and you could throw it across the room, and you could put it in a headlock. It was all, it was a, when I was a kid, that was a big deal. He said, I'll bring home a Hulk Hogan wrestling buddy for each of you if you stay out of your mama and mom's bedroom and you sleep in your own beds. 
They said, all right. You know, they were pretty excited about Hulk Hogan wrestling, buddy. They were pretty excited. So he goes on his trip, goes out of town, and he's coming back into town. And prominent preacher, First Baptist Church downtown. He's coming down the steps or down the escalator. And this was a time where you could, you could meet folks right when they came off the plane. And there's his wife. There's his two boys just waiting at the rail and right, waiting for their dad to come home. And he said he could see from his boy's eyes they had done what he asked because his boy was so excited about getting his wrestling buddy. And he said, there's his youngest just right on the rail. <laughs> Damn! Damn! And he says he gets about halfway down and his boy gets so excited he can't take it anymore. And his boy says, in front of God and everybody, right there in the airport, his boy says, Daddy! Nobody slept with mama the whole time. <laughs> I'm sorry about the inappropriate. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. So, uh, so he gets home. He's like, man, here we go. You know, I have some things to unpack at church the next Sunday. <laughs> but have you, have you ever, have you ever had something inside you? That just welled up so much that you could not keep it inside. You could not keep it to yourself. Well, that's, that's where we're at right here. Because Peter and John have been filled up with the Holy Spirit so much that they cannot and will not keep it inside. They've been filled up with God's Word, with the Scriptures so much that they cannot and will not keep it inside. They're fellowshipping with other believers and it's made them so excited that they cannot and will not keep it in south. And so you rehash this, this section, right? Peter and John are going up to the temple in the hour of prayers, 3 p.m. The, the, uh, the hour that it references here is 3 p.m. And at that time, there were, there were three times to go to prayer. There was morning, noon, and 3 p.m. 3 p.m. was the hour of sacrifice, right? So what that meant is it's the most crowded time to come up to the temple. And Peter and John are walking and they're on their way to a time of prayer. That's it. They're not on their way to a big show. They're not on their way to do anything in particular that they know of except fellowship and have a time of prayer. They're on their way to church. And, and they're on their way to church and they see a beggar. Right? Or I guess more accurately, the beggar sees them. And, and the lame man, the beggar, is not is not uh, missing what's been happening here in the town for the last few days as the Holy Spirit has come and, and Peter has preached sermons and it's right here after Passover and the place is packed. And so he sees Peter and John and he says, these guys may be able to give me what I need. And at that time, beggars would, would come one of three places. So you would beg, either you would pick a spot outside of uh, kind of a nice neighborhood, a wealthy neighborhood, or along the highway, or at the temple. And this guy's chosen to be at the temple. And he's been lame since birth. You'll find out later as you read on that he's over 40 years old. At the time, that's a long time to live that way. Right? And he comes, and he sees these guys, and he says, Hey, help me out. And Peter says, What you were looking for, I don't have. Silver and gold, I don't have. And if, if you remember 242 through 47, uh, the followers of Jesus are kind of living this, uh, this life where they're just kind of throwing things together and nobody needs anything from anybody else. They're just kind of living as one. Now, they didn't all give up their homes and everything because you find out later they still met in homes, right? So everybody didn't give up their homes, but people gave what they needed for one another. That's how they lived. Right? In other words, if we were, if we were meeting church leadership here, and somebody said, man, I can't, I can't afford life insurance. Then the rest of us would say, hey, i got what you need. I'm going to take care of your family if you pass away. Right? And so that, that's kind of the, the way they were living. They said, I'll take care of you. You take care of me. Right? And so Peter, Peter and John says, man, I don't have any silver and gold. But man, i got what you need. i got what you need down deep inside of me. Right? And so Peter, who is filled up with God, says, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. And what he does is he reaches down and heals this lame man. Now let's, let's pull up the brakes right there for a second. Right? Let's just quickly address miracles and, and such as that. Because you may say, hey, that's great for Peter, preacher. But I don't think you expect me to go out and find a, a lame man and reach down and heal him. 
Right? So let's let's talk about that for just a second before we move on, right? So so Jesus Christ was Jesus was very plain in the gospels of the fact that the miracles attested to his authority. Right? So uh, so one verse, John chapter 10, verse uh, verse 23, Jesus said, I've told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. And uh, later, John 14, 11, John 10, 37 through 38, Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, all through the Bible, it's noted that these miracles Right, that Jesus and then later this group of apostles, this inner circle of apostles are doing, is, is simply to say, hey, there is authority from God in what happened. Right? And so Jesus did miracles to prove his authority, right? And so we say that was one aspect of proving his authority. So we say, well, Jesus is who he said he was, right? Look at what he did. And then, of course, resurrected from the dead. Right? And then the disciples were able to do miracles. And what did the disciples do that, or the apostles do that's so important to us? They, they wrote the New Testament. Right? So, so we need to be able to trust the guys who were responsible for that work. Right? And so they did miracles to prove their authority. Now what authority do we need today? The work. Right? So there is no need for, for someone to go out and do instantaneous miracles anymore to prove their authority because we base authority in Jesus Christ on God's word. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Are you following me on that? Because if someone is in line with this, then we say that's authority. And we just went through Colossians where we said it's Jesus and Jesus alone, that there were false teachers, and Paul said if anybody's adding to Jesus and Jesus alone, then that's false. That's misguided. That's wrong, right? So we say, if we're looking for authority, does it line up with the scriptures? The miracles happened at that time to prove authority for the guys that would write the scripture. Are you with me? Yeah? So let me say, do miracles still happen today? Absolutely! Right? When God's people pray and those prayers are in line with God's will, right, then healing takes place. Miracles take place, but never a public display to prove someone's authority. With me? Yeah? Right? Because many of you have received healing from something, right? Or, or a miraculous moment that you prayed for and God answered, but it wasn't the same as Peter walking into a crowd and saying, get up and walk. Does that make sense before we move on? Yeah? Would you say no? If it didn't, I don't know if you would or not. But, but talk to me talk to me afterward if it doesn't, right? Uh, because there is a difference, and do know that we pray for, just like we pray every morning, we pray for folks in our families, in our church families, who are sick, right? We pray for God's miraculous hand to heal them, right? When that's in line with God's will, He heals them and we're good to go. But it's never a matter of us calling WXII on television and saying, hey, look, we want you to show up at 3 p.m. because we're going to heal somebody to prove our authority. No! It's different. It's through prayer. It's through God's will. Okay? Yeah? Miracles 101. Check. We're good there. Alright? So, uh, so back to, to kind of moving on from that. Right? So we move on through that, from that, towards that. Right? What we've got is we've got Peter and John going out and, and living for Christ. Now a lot of us gave our lives to Jesus Christ. We said, I'm a follower of Christ now. Jesus has forgiven me from my sins. I am not the person that I used to be. I am a new creation. I will follow Christ. My old life's gone. I'm forgiven and free. Now what? <laughs> that, that's the question. That's why we come into a place like this on Sunday morning to say, now what? Okay, I've given my life to Jesus. I'm forgiven from my sins. So what's left? Show up to church on Sundays. See you, Jesus, when I die. There's more. Hey, please come showing up. To, please keep showing up to church on Sundays. Right? But there's more. There's more. But what do we do? What's left to do? And so, so we look at Peter and John. They went out, they spoke out, and they reached out. Right? They went out, they spoke out, and they reached out. Now, probably this morning, all we got time for is they went out. Okay? 
Because like Van, I don't want to keep you forever. I'll probably keep you longer than Van keeps you, but I won't keep you forever, right? So, uh, so when out. So, so if I say, all right, Christians, all right, church, we got to go out. We got to go out in our community. We got to go out into our workplace there. We got to go out into our family. We got to share the love of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Because maybe, maybe you, and, and if this is you, man, this, this has been me too in my life as a Christian, right? Maybe you said, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you. And then I step out there, but I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I say, okay, you, you said go out there, but what am I supposed to do about that? And, and oftentimes you can come back kind of hurt, kind of wondering what's next, kind of worn out. Woo! You can come back worn out. When I was, uh, I was a senior in college, my senior year, and I, I had to, there was one, one class, it was a counting class, that I had to do pretty well on in order to pass the class, right? And uh, so I hadn't placed myself in great position there. And I needed to do very well on the exam, right? And so, uh, so it's the day of the exam, and that exam is the only thing on my plate. When I woke up that morning, a counting exam, and that's it. And really, a counting exam, then I go home, right? And so I woke up that morning and I said, you know what would be a good way to kind of clear my mind and, and just feel, breathe a little easier? Was I'll go take a bike ride, right? I'll go ride my bike and I'll go, uh, there's some wildlife lands nearby and they have some good bike trails. And I'm pretty sure, I've never been on it, but I'm pretty sure that's a loop trail where I start here and it loops around and I finish where I start, right? I was not positive about it. But I was pretty sure that was the case. And so I left that morning, I got on my bike about 11 o'clock, and I started riding. And about 1 o'clock, I said, man, this thing should have looked back by now. And I'm looking at my watch, and I said, well, I'll give it about 30 more minutes. About 1.30, that thing hadn't looked back. And so uh, I start doing a little math <laughs> in my head, and I was like, man, I've been riding one way for three and a half hours. I gotta turn around and go back. Woo. I turned around and went back, and man, I busted my tail going back because I knew time was ticking for that, that accounting exam. And I went back and literally pulled back in our apartment. And when I put, I had about 30 minutes to get to the exam. And when I got back in my apartment, I literally, I don't know if you've ever worked out like this or, or done anything where you were like this, but I got off my bike and stood up and my muscles just locked up. Just locked up. And I couldn't bend at the knees. And so I got off my bike, and I went in like that, and I went up our apartment steps, like that. And I got, went up and walked down. I couldn't walk, and I got in my car, and I drove, you know, I put the seat back as far as I could so I could keep it, just move my ankles, it was a straight drive, and, and got to class, and I walked up the steps, you know, in the class, and I made it like 30 seconds spare, and I sat down, you know, and then just kind of kept my, my legs out and did the whole exam like that. Because my legs were just locked and they were burning and they were on fire. And I was wore out. I, I passed. I passed. And, and so what I'm saying is sometimes, man, we can take off and we're not quite sure of the direction because we might not have done the proper homework before. It would have been good to see if that was a loop trail. And we can take off in a direction and we can come back and we just feel wore out. And we can say, Lord, spiritually, I went out like you said go out. And man, I'm locked up. I'm tired. I'm wore out. I'm weary. And my spiritual muscles are just sore and I'm aching. And that can happen. We can feel worn out. We can feel used up. Listen, the Bible the Bible is full of God telling people to go, right? So Genesis 12.1 or Genesis 12.4, God says, Abram, hey, go. Go, I want you to leave everything you know and go. And verse 4 says, so Abram went, right? He went into an unknown land. And so, so Abram went when God said go. God told Moses at the burning bush, I want you to go. And I want you to rescue my people. I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, right? And Moses said, well... Am I really the guy? God, I'm not the greatest speaker. But eventually he went. Right? God told Jonah, go. And what happened? 
Jonah didn't go. Right? We've said it before. God said go. Jonah said no. God said oh. Instead of storm. Right? Lot's wife. God said go. Get out of there. She didn't. She turned into a pillar of salt. She didn't go when God said go. The rich young ruler. Jesus said leave that behind and go. Rich young ruler couldn't do it. He didn't go. God told Samson to go a certain direction. Samson went the other direction. He went where he shouldn't have went. How do you know where you're supposed to go? How do you know how to live this life? And here's what I'm getting at. How do you know how to walk the walk of following Jesus? Because I can promise you this morning, it's more than just showing up today. Right? It's all those other things through the week. Because the point of showing up today is to ring the bell in your heart. And say, man, I want to get out there and I want to go and proclaim the gospel with the people that I know and the people that I love. But how do you do that? How do you do that? How do I know? Three things. Prepare, partner up, and remember your powers. Prepare, partner, powers. Now, the first two are pretty easy, right? Prepare. Well, well I bet you know where I'm going here. Right? <laughs> Prepare. Man, spend some time in His Word. Spend some time by yourself in His Word. Take some time. Because look, you won't know where to go unless you spend some time in His Word. So pick a book. It can be Genesis. It can be John. It can be Mark. It can be Colossians. It can be Acts. Pick a book. Start at chapter 1. Start reading. Prepare. Prepare yourself for this walk. Because unless you're spending time in God's Word, you won't walk. Well, this is how you learn to walk. It's how you learn. And, and immediately, initially, you're going to feel iffy, and you're going to say, well, I don't understand that. What, what if when you were learning to walk, or maybe it's more you remember your kids were learning to walk, or your grandkids were learning to walk. What if when they started off kind of wobbling and fell on the rear end, if, if at that point they had said, no, nah, no more of this. No more of this. I'm done walking. No. You got to build up those muscles. Right? You got to have some encouraging mom and dad on the other side. Come on, come on. You got a candy bar or a toy or a squeaky duck or something. They got to say, come on. There needs to be some encouragement there. You've got to start off in this word and you got to realize you're going to be a little shaky. You're going to be a little wobbly. You might not understand every word of this thing. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep reading. Keep reading. Make some time. Read his word and pray. You might be a little shaky in prayer too. What am I, how am I supposed to do that? Just talk. Maybe your opening line could be, Jesus, how am I supposed to do this? <laughs> That's okay. Right? That's okay. You say, hey, Jesus, I'd like to know you better. Spend a little time in prayer. Tell him about your day. Right? Prepare. See, uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, if I had 25 years to live, I'd spend 20 of them prepared. I'd spend 20 of them studying. Spurgeon uh, was not a seminary professor or, or grand out seminary graduate. Spur Spurgeon just dove into the Word. He dove into the books and the resources around him. Right? You don't have to be a seminary professor to prepare. Use what you got. Prepare. How do I know? How do you know? You won't know anything until you prepare. Right? Prepare for what? Just prepare. Peter and John did not know that they would come across a lame man that day. They didn't know, did they? But they had spent time in the Word and they had prepared and so God said go out and they went out. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. All right, the second thing is partner up. Now a lot of preparation is solo. You should spend a lot of time on your own in preparation. You should spend a lot of time with other Christians in preparation. Here on Sunday morning, Sunday school, some small groups are starting a Bible study, whatever it is. YouTube, if you got a good preacher on YouTube, whatever it is, prepare, right? You might be able to do that with some other people, but you should also do it solo. But this is important. <coughs> Partner up. Now, Peter and John went out together. All right, now we learn in the Gospels that Peter and John were pretty good friends. They were, uh, they were actually fishing partners, right? That's, that's in the Gospel, that they were partners in fishing uh, from the St. Luke chapter 5, verse 10. That, that they had known each other a while. They were good friends. They had walked with Jesus side by side. They needed some fellowship with one another. And when it was time to go out, they grabbed somebody near and dear to their heart and they went in. 
Maybe you've got somebody near and dear in your heart that, that you can share this walk of Christ with. If you don't, man, there's a, there's a crop of good people in here that would be good volunteers, right? Grab one and say, man, be my partner on this walk. I need some help on this walk. Prepare. Partner up. Right? Prepare and partner up. Now, here's the last one. This, this is the one. It's not going to go as quick as those other two. This, this is pretty important. Remember you are powerless. That's, that's a heck of a thing to say. Right? Hey, tell me to go out and walk. Tell me to go out and do some stuff for Jesus. And then tell me I ain't got no power. What the what? <laughs> You're powerless, but he is not. So what does that mean? You lean in hard on Jesus. You lean in hard on the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in you. Right? You say, what's the next right thing to do? Dallas Willard said, your Christian walk is what's the next right thing to do? And then when I'm there, I realize I don't have the power to do it, but I lean on Jesus for his power to do it. When, uh, when Finn was learning how to swim, right? So before he, before he could swim, way back, way like last year. No, I'm just kidding, man. He's not here, so I can pick on him. <laughs> so, so way back when he was uh, like four or five, he, was, he couldn't swim yet. Maybe four, he couldn't swim yet. But man, he was fearless to a dangerous degree, right? And we would be in a pool. I remember being at the pool at the beach at, at the place we were staying. And he would just, he had learned early on, he could run from the side of the pool. And, and I'd be there to catch him, right? And he could run. I know you've done this. You've seen this. He'd run from the side. And he'd cannonball toward me. And I'd catch him and, you know, hug him. And then I'd put him back on the side and he'd be all right, right? Well, soon he got so fearless with that where he didn't care if I was waiting for him or not. He would just start running. And he would jump into the water because he said, I know Dad will get me. I know Dad will catch me. And, of course, I would. But sometimes I didn't know it. And I was holding another kid. I remember one time I was holding another kid and I just see this shadow just flailing over the water. And I turned and Finley's just running through the air, headed toward the pool. And I had to take one kid and hand it to a grandparent and run over as fast as I could to where he was going in because I knew he couldn't swim. Right? But I ran and I scooped him up and got him back and put him up and he laughed and he had a good time. And he would do that constantly. He would just take off from any direction at any time with no warning. And just died into that pool because he knew I would get it. He knew I wouldn't leave him stranded. He didn't know exactly what he was doing yet, but he knew I wouldn't let him fail. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. Is you say, okay, Jesus, I've, I've prepared, man. Every day I spend time in your work. Every day I spend time in prayer. You're welling up inside me to the point I can't keep this in. I'm going to go out. I don't know what it looks like, but I know you're going to catch me. I'm going to do the next right thing, and I'm going to lean on you to catch me. Peter, who is in this story in Acts, is a brilliant example of this. All right, because you remember the story of Peter walking on the water in, in the Gospels? Right? They're in the boat, and, and everybody looks over, and they see this figure walking on the water, and somebody in the boat says, that's a ghost. <laughs> that's what we would say, too, right? They say, that's a ghost. And, and then somebody says, no, nah, I think that's Jesus. And Peter says, Jesus, if that's you, call my name, and, and I'll come out to you. Now, check this out. So, uh, so we're, we're in Matthew 14, 22 through 23. You can listen or you can live. Matthew 14, that story starts in 22. So Peter answered him in verse 28. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Come on. Come to me on the water. And Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. That's what it says. Verse 29. Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water. And came to now what do we remember? We remember, boop, Peter failed. He almost drowned until Jesus picked him up. But what I want you to hear this morning is he started walking. Let's say he took three steps. How many steps did the other disciples take on the water? Zero. And if I were Peter, do you know what I'd have done? 
I held up this right here all day long. I said, John, how many steps did you take on the water? Zero. Guess how many I took? Three. I'd have got a hat printed that would have said three. At, at night, at the campfires, when they're around the campfire and they're snoozing off to sleep, right? And everybody's almost asleep. You know what I do? <coughs> three. Because <laughs> none of the other disciples took a single step. Not a single step. Peter took some steps on the water. Jesus called him and he took some steps on the water. Now, don't you think that meant something to him later on in his life? Where he said, man, the same Jesus that allowed me to walk on water said, go on out there and do something in the world around you. Don't you think that meant different? Because he had the courage to get out of the boat and take some steps on the water. And guess who called him when he had trouble? Guess who pulled him up when he had trouble? You may say, well, man, I'm, I'm not skilled enough. I'm, I'm not articulate enough. I don't know enough. Hey, his father's that. Dads, what is your favorite gift that a kid has ever given you? Was it handmade? Yeah. I love him. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't understand that. I'm like, who wants some macaroni pasta piece of artwork? I don't know. <laughs> but, but I tell you, who did. My mom and dad wanted that. Right? And I get that as a father now, right? That when a kid makes something, writes something, does something, that's, that's beautiful. Right? Because they took the time to do it and they put it out there. Now, it's not going to be hanging in, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Probably. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> it's not going to be hanging in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But, but to me, man, I wouldn't trade it for one of those pieces of art in there. Why? Because it's what my kid made with the talents that they had and they offered it up to me. That's how you walk. You take the talents that you have and you give it to him in whatever form you give it. And man, he is honored by that. He is honored by that. And he says, man, that's, that's my boy. That's my girl. They're walking. They're walking this walk. And whatever is the next right thing to do, that's your next step. What's your next right thing to do today? That's your next step. How do you know what the next right thing to do is today? You prepare. You start to live the way that he said live. Where were Peter and John going? They were going to pray. They were going to church. And along the way, they were interrupted. And because they had prepared, they did the next right thing. Peter said, I got this inside of me. I don't have silver and gold. I know that's what you want. I got something better. We talked about miracles. What's the greatest miracle that happens today? in God's church, in this world. It's the transformation of a heart that's sinful and the old creation is gone and the new creation comes forth, right? It's a forgiven and a free heart. That's the miracle that God shows off now, right? And so you go out and you walk this walk. You walk this new walk. And whatever the next step is, that's the step to take. And God will meet you there because you're using whatever gift you've got to walk that walk. Are you with me, church? Do you feel that? Do you hear that? We are not capable of doing this on our own. We are powerless. What is the, the symbol, the reminder of Christianity? It's a cross. It's a cross. There's a few of them in the building. It's a cross. It's a cross. In your hymnal, there's books with crosses. Maybe some of you got a necklace with a cross. What does the cross represent? Man, it represents the power of Christ overcoming our inability to get it right. The, this whole thing is wrapped around our inability to get it right. So he got it right on the cross for us. He lives in us. We are forgiven for the things that we were unable to do or the things that we chose not to do. He met us at the cross, forgave us for our sins, which gives us the ability to walk forward as free and forgiven children so that we can know Him and love Him and walk out there with Him. How do you live this life as a Christian? You do the next right thing. And you rely on Christ to give you the power in that thing. 
Yeah? Yeah. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you are good. You are holy. You are magnificent. We come before you and we ask that you would fill us up with your power. That you fill us up with your spirit. Lord, not so that the rest of the world could look at us and say, man, they're awesome. But so that they can look at us and say, man, Jesus must be incredible. Because I know that person and they ain't that good. So Jesus must be that good. Fill us up with that, Lord. Fill us up with you. So that when folks look at us, they can be reminded of the cross. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you and we praise you today. And help that come through as we sing together and we worship you now. And help that come through as we leave this film today and we spend time with our family or our friends or somebody on the phone and we do that next right thing that you told us to do and you'll provide an opportunity for your glory to show through it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand and let's sing together. Let's worship. And as we stand and sing, just want to remind you, maybe you say, man, I've, I've been wondering what the next right thing to do is. Uh, you can go ahead and stand up. I've been wondering what, I won't talk out long. I've been wondering what the next right thing to do is, right? Hey, I, I've been wondering how this works. And Jesus, I need you to fill me up. I, I need you. I need forgiveness. I need freedom. I need direction. Come on. Go to the altar and ask him that. Ask, seek, and knock. Those are his promises. And he'll answer. He will answer. Step in your pew. He'll meet you right there. You can come to the altar. You can come, you can come to him in your pew. But ask him, what's the next step? Give me strength to see that. 399. 399.